Jack Rosenthal's father escaped the evils of the Holocaust. Jack was three years old when his parents immigrated from Palestine to America in the 1930s. As a teenager, he loved to check out library books and read the newspaper. It helped him learn English and feel more American. From then on, Jack dreamed of becoming a journalist. He pursued his dream with determination and not only succeeded, but reached the top of his profession as an editor for the New York Times. His success was so great that he won journalism's highest honor, the Pulitzer Prize, in 1982. Jack Rosenthal helped millions of people become American when he worked with Attorney General Robert Kennedy, brother of President John F. Kennedy, in the 1960s to reopen America's doors to immigrants. In pursuing his own American dream, Jack Rosenthal has furthered the dreams of the immigrants who came after him. I hadn't realized until I went to the Holocaust Museum in Washington uh, how quickly Hitler's edicts took effect, but he came into power on April 1st, 1933. And by April 15th, almost all of the horrible anti-Semitic, anti-Jewish, and other minority group uh, edicts had been put in place. Uh, it was during that somewhat, sometime during that two-week period that my father told of going to work one morning, climbing the stairs to the Hall of Justice. And for the first time, flanking the, the door, ceremonial doors, were two stormtroopers who would cross their rifles in front of each person coming in. And they started to push my father down the stairs with their rifles. At which moment the chief justice arrived and he dismissed these two hooligans and he said, you will stand aside and let this man, he's a distinguished judge of the court and you will treat him with respect. So sullenly they fell back. Um, my fa father went home that night and thought about this experience and he decided he had two choices. One was to carefully time his arrival at work every day with that of the Chief Justice. And the other was to get out. And uh, about six weeks later, he was in Tel Aviv, the only place he could get to quickly, with the equivalent of about $200 and no job. Uh, so he became a bookkeeper and scratched a living together. Six weeks after he got there, he met an attractive young woman who was visiting from Lithuania. Uh, her father was a lumberman in Lithuania and he had sent her to Paris and Jerusalem and Tel Aviv to go see the world. Uh, she was staying with a friend. <clears throat> they met at some party and in short order they were married and produced a child, me. Um, during this time, my father got a job with a technology company that required him to go back and forth frequently from Jerusalem to Tel Aviv uh, on a windy mountain road, which at that time was subject to uh, another and er much earlier round of Arab terrorism. Bombs would go off on the British convoys would be blown off the side of the hill by bombs every now and then. And my mother, with a little kid at home, was exceedingly nervous about his being subject to this peril. So she implored him to please write the famous relatives in America to see if they wouldn't sponsor us for immigration to the United States. I can still remember, I mean, I was age three or so, I still, when I hear the word affidavit, it has a certain resonance, a certain thrill to it, because I can remember the day the word came that Uncle Anselm Bosco was in Portland, Oregon, wherever that was, had signed the affidavit and put up a hundred dollars bond to guarantee that we would not become public charges. And that was the last barrier. And so we packed up and took a ship to Trieste and took another ship, the Vulcania, across the Atlantic um, in October of 1938. I was three and a half and have really vivid memories of it. 
the last morning, it was very early in the morning, it must have been 5.36, it was still dark, but just barely getting light. And my father, and it was very cold, my father woke me up, shook me awake, put on my little coat, said, come on, we're going upstairs. Went up to the deck, and he held me up on the rail, went out of this mist and gloom, suddenly appeared this giant, angry, green woman. We spent a couple days with relatives in New York, and then three days and nights on the train to Oregon, the streamliner of the city of Portland. That was the Concord of its time. Um, and settled in Oregon. Um, my father got a job as a bookkeeper after weeks and weeks of trying during the Depression. It was really scary. But in time, he began to make a modest living. And then came the war. He got a job in the shipyards, important, a defense job. My mother, in a way, symbolizes the 20th century. Uh, all the events, bad and good. As she was born in Lithuania of well-to-do parents uh, just before World War I began. She saw World War I up close that way. Uh, she saw Arab Jewish tension and British three-way tension in Palestine. Um, she was in the United States for World War II, but lived through a lot of World War II experiences here. Probably 1943, we lived in an apartment owned by Uncle Anselm. One Sunday afternoon, there was a sharp knock on the door and my mother answered it, and there were two men in hats, and they showed FBI identification. Could we come in? She just about fainted. She was so scared. What did they want from us? I mean, a woman who had been through the kinds of things she'd been through. Um, so they came in, and my father came into the living room. There was some thought that he was a Nazi, Nazi spy. What? Why? Why? Well, one of the neighbors had heard this tapping, tapping, tapping from our apartment, thinking it was a telegraph key. It was my father's little portable typewriter, a little Smith fold-over Smith Corona portable that he did taxes on for his people he did business for. But it tells you something about the paranoia and the ignorance of a lot of people in this country. Um, it makes me intensely sympathetic to Islamic Americans to Muslims in this last round of scare. Um, how horrible it is to be assumed to be guilty of something horrible, even though you've done your level best to make a decent life. My mother had 10 brothers and sisters of whom she thought none had survived the Nazis. But after the war, soon after the war, probably early 46, um, there was a German-Jewish newspaper published in New York called Aufbau, Reconstruction. And many of the pages were classified ads for people looking for relatives. And in one particular issue, there was an ad, Jay Kaplan seeks sister Rachel Kaplan, he thinks her last name is Rosenthal. And somebody who was some distant cousin saw it in New York and called long distance, which was a big deal then, and wondered if this could possibly be Rachel Rosenthal, who's, and my God, she shrieked. I was home when this happened. It was an astonishing moment. I was really frightened. Joseph Kaplan had survived Dachau. They brought him to this country. It was, took a long time for, 
It took the better part of a year. But they finally got him here. It was complicated. And it was a joyous experience, but it was much more complicated than joyous because you could not have gone through four years in a concentration camp and come out altogether uh, calm and comfortable. I mean, he was, had a lot of things to work out. And there was a lot of tension in the household on and off. But one of my fondest early memories of, was he became friendly with some other DPs, displaced persons who had come to this country. And some of them took a, uh, became roommates and took a flat together. And they, that used to be the clubhouse. And Uncle Joseph now and then would ask if I wanted to go to help them learn English. They could speak, they could get by with their English, but the, it was n not at all idiomatic. They knew no vernacular. They had nobody they could, without embarrassment, ask kind of obvious cultural questions about. Well, I, as a child, had gone through all that myself. Um, and so I was eager to do it. Americanization was a big subject in our household. My mother took an Americanization class. It was given by the Daughters of the American Revolution. And now and then she would drag me along, and I hated it. But then they had a graduation ceremony, and she was one of the people asked to participate in the program. Um, and they did us the further honor of asking Master Jack Rosenthal to lead this I was five, six, to lead in the Pledge of Allegiance. So they were very conscious of wanting to become American. Uh, they would never, didn't want to talk about the old country, didn't much want to talk about their experiences. They wanted to focus entirely on the future. Um, but we were a very poor household. Uh, there wasn't any money for anything like books, even though my father was a reader. Um, so I got an early library card and brought books home in, in a shopping bag. Um, but my main Americanizing influence was the newspaper, was the Oregonian, which I read, I guess I read when I was young. Um, and I decided early on, without even thinking about it, it just became an automatic assumption I was going to go into journalism because I wanted to explain to other people what the newspaper had explained to me or or didn't as it happened the Oregonian had a, a hobby column it's called young Oregonians a series of clubs for kids who came down to the basement of the newspaper in this little club room and among them was the young Oregonian reporters club and you'd come there and they had some old battered typewriters and you'd peck out these little stories and if they were good enough, they'd put them in the paper. And they'd give you a byline by Jack Rosenthal, young Oregonian reporter. So on a story about Beethoven's birthday or my paper route, uh, you know, two or three paragraphs. But my God, here I am in the paper. I mean, that's that then in that era, that was better than being on TV as now. Um, and the relatives would call up and say, is that him? Well, it was thrilling, and then I hung around the paper, and I eventually ended up in the sports department as a volunteer copy boy. If the newspaper was one way to Americanize yourself, sports was another. The combination was unbeatable, because then you could talk with anybody's language, anybody's American language. You had something to talk about with anybody, and you could prove how regular you were because of what you knew about the Portland Beavers or the Oregon State basketball team, uh, Red Rocha. Uh, and I got really interested in, in, into sports. And I was a pretty good baseball player, but uh, the real thrill was to hang around the sports department. Uh, the decision to go to Harvard uh, had some real poignance to it. My mother could see no purpose to this. How are we going to find the money, even with a scholarship, even if you work? We're going to have to find some money to do this. Why don't you stay home, live at home, and go to Reed College, which is perfectly good, excellent school, instead of putting 
me and your father through this kind of hardship. Um, there was then in Portland something called the Friendship Club, uh, an association of German refugees in Portland. The president of the Friendship Club was a, a wonderful man named Julian Shipley. And uh, when he discovered that I'd gotten into Harvard and my mother didn't want to let me go, he took her aside and he said, Rachel, you don't understand what a big deal this is. Uh, if money is the issue, I'll guarantee it. Oh, I can't remember ever being more grateful to anybody. The dominant discovery I made when I got to Cambridge was how American a place Portland, Oregon was and how relatively un-American or how un uh, melting potted other parts of the country were. I grew up not thinking of somebody with, George Pissarro was the sports editor of the other newspaper. It never dawned on me to think that Pissarro was an Italian name. I mean, it was just a name. I got to Boston and discovered if you had an Irish name or an Italian name or a Jewish name. And I realized in a way how doubly fortunate I was to have grown up in Oregon. Uh, because it was so democratic a place. After college, I went back to the Oregonian, became a sports writer full-time, and then uh, a regular reporter. I got an offer in 1961 to come be interviewed to work in Robert Kennedy's office at the Justice Department. Well, I mean, think back to the beginning of the new frontier. Anybody who was around then knows it was just a perf for young people it was a thrilling thing could not imagine something more exciting than to be good than to go to washington let alone to be asked to work for the president's brother and that meant i had a front row seat for something i was dying for all of us to be involved in which was <clears throat> immigration reform from a college article about the mccarran walter act to uh, working in the Justice Department that drafted and, and got enacted the Immigration Reform Act of 65. Um, by the time of the Immigration Reform Act of 86, I was the deputy and then the editor of the New York Times editorial page and led a huge campaign, an editorial campaign, to get that bill passed. Um, and Senator Simpson later said, Without the leadership of the Times, he didn't think it would have passed. And I guess the whole experience of being an immigrant outsider, um, ha at least in my case, had to have a deep psychological effect. I find myself, even today, ex extremely conscious of, be of sticking out, of not wanting to expose myself as somebody who's not quite authentic. So you could not come from the, my life, my background, and not feel innate and intense uh, empathy and sympathy for what newcomers go through and how hard they're willing to work to make a life for themselves. Jack Rosenthal spent more than 20 years as an editor for the New York Times, winning a Pulitzer Prize for editorial writing in 1982. He now gives back to America as president of the New York Times Foundation, which donates millions of dollars to charitable organizations throughout the United States. <laughs> 